Hey guys, has everyone had coffee? Just making sure before we start. Yes? All right. Good. Very well done. Hey, so um, I wasn't sure if I understood the exact notion of the flashback track, so what I'm going to do is, for some reason, take you through the slides that I had done last time and then talk about all the stuff that's changed in the meantime. Cool ringtone. Um, so, it, but what I'd like to do is, if you have questions, not if you have a comment that you'd like everyone else to hear, but if you have questions, can you just like let me know because it's better if we get those out of the way? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, at the time that I gave the talk, uh, we were actually trying to understand, you know, the relevance of some of this stuff, and it was actually in the midst of some very serious debates. Do you guys remember the Apple FBI case? All right. Who wants to tell someone else what, what happened? Anybody? If you remember it. I've got a lot of nods. So if you remember it, tell someone else what happened. Come on. Come on. What didn't they want to disclose? Not exactly. Does anyone? Yep. Yes, how did they want to unlock the phone? Does anyone remember what they specifically asked of Apple? You know, Craig, just tell them. The, the, yeah, the pin code, but they wanted to do something specific. They actually wanted to send a software update, so they wanted the signing key for iOS. All right? So here's the deal. There is a gradation, like a gradient, from asking to unlock one iPhone and then asking to have the signing key for iOS. You know, there's like a little tiny bit of difference between the two things. But those were the discussions that were happening at the time. And what you saw was the FBI had had their case completely ready. They were ready to go. So the idea that was there on the shelf is that, okay, you know, uh, the FBI had been planning this for ages. They were just looking for an opportunity in order to come out with all this legal stuff to try to force Apple to give this type of cooperation with the authorities. And the way that you look at this problem, whether you think, what a bullshit, it was like a, you know, almost a terrorist incident, of course Apple should cooperate and give everything they need for law enforcement. How many of you believe that? I'm serious. It's, uh, it's okay. It depends on your point of view, right? So if you really believe that there are extreme cases, and the usual ones that are used are pedophilia and terrorism, where you are forcing cooperation of private companies to assist in these type of law enforcement actions. So again, how many of you feel in extreme cases, pedophilia, terrorism, national security, that you should cooperate with the authorities? Okay, I'm putting my hand up for you guys. I don't, this is not a representation of belief. I, I want to point out that the, there is some divide, that it's okay to have this point of view. Not okay for me to yell at you through the microphone. But um, that this contention means that we have allowed a certain amount of rights and permissibility to our governments in order to act on our behalf to promote and provide for public safety. Okay. Sometimes, though, uh, especially like when I was presenting this talk, there was a concern that there was a huge discrepancy between the initial intent and the actual action of the authorities when it came to some of these subjects. And, you know, like I like to say that like national security is pretty much the root password to everything. Oh, it's a case of national security. All right, here you go. Here's all the data. Here's access to the telecommunications network. Here is everything that we've ever used, you know, in every record we've ever maintained. But what you see is that intelligence agencies, as a result of this national security root password, that they have complete and utter information awareness. They know everything. They know who you call. They know where you've been. They know all of your list of friends and how they hang out. And that these agencies, even though they have this complete unfettered access to all of this data and can force mandatory cooperation and include that with silence. You're never allowed to discuss these issues when you cooperate with the authorities. So even though they can do all this shit, they still are afraid of cryptography and they call this the going dark problem. Have you guys heard of that? The going dark problem? Yeah. Okay. So what you see is that this going dark problem of anyone who's using publicly available cryptography to hide in any of their information is a serious concern because it means that the eye of Sauron that's coming out of these agencies is not able to penetrate these pockets using crypto. So 
you know, there's a lot of attempts to do cryptanalysis, to break the cryptography, to do traffic analysis, to try to determine who's talking to who. None of this should come as, as strange. But uh, even though we knew the extent of which some of these activities were happening and the mass surveillance was going on, you didn't really see a sort of knee-jerk reaction that was a sort of common reaction from the public. You saw a little bit of outrage on CNN, but how many of you live in countries where the legislation actually changed after the Snowden revelations? Even in the United States, the legislation didn't really change after the Snowden revelations because the initial... Um, authority where all of the work that was based on the Patriot Act, the makers of the Patriot Act, when they were actually conducting a review, said no fair interpretation of the Patriot Act could have led to the abuses which it led to. So the makers of the act themselves acknowledged that there was a far-reaching action that was not in line with the original intent of the Patriot Act. And that's really the problem. So this stuff, talk about flashback, it should bring you to the way, way back machine where we had the original crypto wars. Does anyone remember that? It's an age test. No? Original crypto, you do remember, and you're just not putting up your hand, Craig. Very disappointing. Um, so all the old people in the room, um, the original crypto wars, they were fought in the 1990s. And if you remember, what it was was that, like, there were these heads of the FBI, and what they wanted to do was have surveillance capabilities everywhere. We're not even talking about the NSA. We're talking about the FBI who wanted to do this. And the guy who was at the FBI who did it, and I know they have a slight resemblance, but this was Louis Free. Does anyone remember him? Well, Louis Free was al also famous because he investigated the famous blue dress. You know, Monica Lewinsky, Clinton, the blue dress with the stain. No, no one, they, I don't. Okay, meet me after if you want to know. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the the clue is so this that's this is guy that was his CV. You know he took down the mafia, he fought this evil cryptography machine, and he managed to investigate you know Clinton. So but at the time and now I miss him. Now I like Comey's my homie stickers everywhere. But um, we also had uh, James Comey who was saying, look, I don't want. Back doors in cryptography. I want front doors. I want, with a court order, to be able to come in to anyone's so-called house with a lawful, like, authority, with a warrant. And I want to be mandated to do this by the court. And they wanted the same thing, you know, at any time to be able to come in. And actually, it's not that different from other governments across the world. So if you take a look at the French government, the English government, they all wanted the same thing. You know, they wanted to be able to come in. They wanted to have key escrow or other such, like, huge repercussive uh, types of capability. And part of this, you know, in order to do the kind of stuff that they wanted to do, it requires a certain amount of magical thinking. And those of you that are familiar with it will understand why. Because basically what they said is, look, I want to be able to get into any type of communications or communications device at any time. And I want to do that. Maybe we can, you know, split the keys or I get like this magical unicorn shaped poopy golden key. And with my golden key, when I have a court order, I can just unlock something. And by the way, Nobody else will find this master key, just for me. How many of you believe that? If you do, you really need to see me later. So uh, the the clue is that this magical thinking now, the DUI phone, the DUI was not phone only sensors, to uh, a few people. Have an encryption in it that uh, you can't get into the. They're encrypted and there's no backdoor key. Uh, and uh, just wanted to know what uh, and of course this is different from the their predecessors that other phones were able to get into. What is your, uh, well, what is the FBI's position on Apple and Google's decision both to encrypt these smartphones? We have a huge problem uh, where we in law enforcement, state, local, federal, and in national security work increasingly, when we have court process, right, judges issue search warrants or interception orders, we are unable to execute on those orders. Uh, and because the device is locked or the communications are encrypted. And so I, we're drifting to a place where a whole lot of people are going to look at us with tears in their eyes and say, what do you mean you can't? My daughter's missing. You have her phone. What do you mean you can't? Tell me who she was texting with before she disappeared. And all I keep saying to folks is a democracy should never drift. Maybe that's where we want to go. But I think we have to have a conversation in this country about where are we going? I don't want backdoors. Right? I want with court process the ability to gather evidence 
evidence after I've shown probable cause to believe on that device is evidence of a crime. The Fourth Amendment is clearly in play, and I follow it, and I get authority. Uh, we need to discuss if we're going to go to a place we can't get access. So it's a huge feature we're discussing. It was sheriffs and chiefs raised with me everywhere in the country and say these are important in domestic violence cases, child exploitation cases, car wrecks, uh, and, and I don't know exactly what the answer is, uh, but it's something we have to talk about. So, you know, you mentioned about... All right. So here's the deal, guys. Uh, it sounds really rough, right? You want to help this guy. Again, Comey's my homie now, but at the time when he said this, I was like, yeah, right. This is a lot of bullshit. And why is it bullshit? Any ideas? <coughs> Do you really need Apple or Google to tell you who texted who? All right, then. Exactly. So do you need Apple or do you need AT&T? And by the way, all of the lawful interception systems at telecom networks are super mature and can do this all the time. And if you just have access to iCloud, you know, that's a different type of permissive action to go ask if this stuff is backed up that you just get it from there. So again, this is bullshit and it's being sold to senators who buy that bullshit and then take it on board. Yes. Is it a question or a comment? It's a comment. Okay, leave it for later. You missed my intro when I said no comments. Oh, sorry. No, questions are for, for good, so please ask questions, but please reserve your comments for later um, or talk to me afterwards. So, yeah. All right. Hey, listen, the clue is that he had alternatives, so it wasn't just AT&T. If he really has something that is actually locally stored on the device, there were alternatives other than asking for the signing key to iOS. And I, I'm joking, you know, why doesn't the FBI drop acid or get lasered? I'm kidding. I'm joking. So, um, but there are uh, options that he could have done. You know, he could have tried to look at how he defeats a secure enclave or, you know, uh, do some actual decapping or actually figure out with infrared laser glitching how to strip off every layer and then do it that way. And I want to show you something because there actually is a video at the time. This is all three and a half years ago. Okay. There was a Sengen market <laughs> trick. Yo, guys, this guy from b -Sop. You know, Apple has always priced its product for its storage space, right? So, Hold on. The, apart from the storage okay. space, everything and anything in the phone is the same. But it's a hundred dollar more if you buy a 16 gigabyte phone compared to a 16 gigabyte. And we have one now here at Shenzhen, Huachang Bay, China. And I heard one man has challenged the Apple pricing strategy single handedly. Let's check out what it is. So here is where all the magic takes place. These guys have just <laughs> where all the magic takes place. They will change my 16 gigabyte iPhone 6 to 128 gigabytes, and they will only charge me sixty dollars. Apps are getting bigger these days. Not much chance they use it for more photos, videos, and other things to keep up technology. It could be more annoying when I want to take a photo, but a notification window pops up saying there is not enough space. So of totally different reason, but look what he's doing. He's just able to completely swap the phone. He's just has access to hardware. Looks to me the process is somewhat like putting an elephant into the fridge and can be summarized into three steps. First is taking my own 16G Hynix flash panel off the main board. Second, you transfer the basic data, like serial number, to the new 128 Toshiba. Guys, I'm like. And so, put the new flash memory back to the main board and reinstall the iOS. Shall we take before the notification? 
on the right is the system intro displayed on the modified phone itself. The usable capacity was up from 11.9 G to 140 okay. G. Serial number and other ID information associated with the phone was exactly the same. The point is, this guy was able to do all of this in a Shenzhen market for super, super cheap, but he didn't require a lot of user interaction in order to actually get to the data on the phone. And that's like kind of the point. The FBI could have done the same thing. They could have asked the cooperation of the NSA to lock it. They didn't do any of those things and instead try to figure out how they can just brute force this access directly uh, by demanding the most of the, that they could with Apple. So it wasn't really a question of is it the Apple versus FBI. It wasn't even a question, is it privacy versus security, which is what a lot of people in the media made it. It was really a question of, you know, what rights do private companies have to retain their liberty versus the control that's exercised by government in certain cases that is far beyond. Again, it's action versus intent. It goes far beyond the original depth of powers that was given to them in order to promote and protect public safety. So this is relevant because it actually causes some unintended effects. Are you concerned about how hard um, China is making it for U.S. tech companies to do business there? I am concerned. Uh, this is uh, something that I... I miss him, too. Oh, my God, I miss him. Uh, and, uh, my entire foreign policy team, as well as people like Secretary of uh, Treasury Jack Lew and Secretary of Commerce, uh, Penny Pritzker, have raised with them. Uh, they've got a couple of laws that are working their way through the system uh, that would essentially force all foreign companies, including U.S. companies, to turn over to the Chinese government uh, mechanisms where they could snoop and uh, keep track of uh, all the users of those services. And as you might imagine, uh, tech companies uh, are not going to be uh, willing to do that. Uh, those kinds of restrictive practices, I think, uh, would uh, ironically hurt the Chinese economy over the long term. Uh, because I don't think there's any uh, U.S. or European firm, any international firm, uh, that can credibly uh, get away with uh, that wholesale turning over of data, personal data, uh, over to a government. And so we've made very clear to them that uh, this I'm is going to stop him if because here's the deal. There is no foreign government that's going to have the wholesale turning over of data. And this applies to China, but it equally applies, of course, to the United States, Right. So why wouldn't we demand the same things from all governments? And imagine this magic key, of this golden key again. You'd have to basically split your key, your master key, if you are Apple or Google or whoever, and you'd have to give a master key to the Chinese government. You'd have to give a master key to the American government. So again, imagine what it would require for you to be able to do this well and for the government to be able to do this well. You'd have to have like perfect technical execution and flawless process execution by these governments. I want to ask you, have you ever seen a government do anything with flawless execution? So these types of tasks are not something that you want to just give to a government and let them figure out how to do it right. And it comes back to this initial idea. You know, you saw in the James Comey video, he talked about, look, this is a real problem for the Fourth Amendment. For the Fourth Amendment is a right to search and seizure. But you also have the Second Amendment. Do you guys know it? The Americans might know it. You know the Second Amendment? The right to bear arms. So Americans have at all times the right to bear arms. And in the original crypto wars, the reason there was a war was because the State Department of the United States had said cryptography is a weapon. It's you cannot just trade cryptography or give it to countries without an export license from the U.S. State Department. And all of the cryptographers said no. Cryptography belongs in the public domain. Everyone should have access to good crypto. Damn it, that was actually kind of dumb. Because if it was a weapon, we'd all have the right to bear it. And there would be no way you could, you know, don't take away my crypto. It would be like a, sno a slogan instead of just the NRA kind of thing. You know, crypto kills people. I don't know. But um, the clue is that 
There's this great uh, KXED comic about it as well, but cryptography protects way more than just the bad guys who are doing this terrorism and pedophilia. As you know, you know, free speech, fair trial, the right to dissent, the ability to have fair competition and intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a wealth of things why you want to protect your cryptography. And so, like, where does this go from cryptography to quantum? Well, we need to talk about quantum a little bit first in order to kind of bridge that gap. Um, the first thing is, you know, when I originally got interested in quantum, it was because I was working on lawful intercept systems. So I was building national lawful intercept uh, networks in order for governments with a warrant to correctly be able to intercept only the traffic needed, not let the attacker know they were doing any interception, and making sure that those systems were fully ad- auditable, accountable, etc. Yeah? So um, I had met someone who said, you know, that's all well and good, but how do you deal with it when you're dealing with post-quantum cryptography or quantum key distribution? And I said, no, 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 it doesn't matter. You still capture the traffic. And then it's the challenge of the governments to decrypt it later. And they usually have techniques and tactics to do that. And they said, well, that does not work when it comes to QKD. So I tried to figure out how does this work? And what you see is when we talk about things that are quantum, we're all talking about all things around quantum technologies. And in order to look at quantum, we have to kind of take our head away from where we think about classical physics. Classical physics is a study of macroscopic things, right? Big stuff, big things, big reactions that we can see. When we talk about quantum, it's really different. It's all about super, super, super small stuff. And it's really a different type of study. So quantum kind of emerged in the 1920s with Niels Bohr. And if you guys uh, ever see all that picture, you know, with Einstein sitting on the front row with all these other scientists, that was the Solvay conference. And that's kind of like the seminal moment where Einstein and Bohr started arguing about quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, for a large extent, is very counterintuitive. So you have, you know, Feynman and you have Bohr even saying, like, if you really understand it or if it hasn't completely shocked you, you don't really understand it. And if you think you understand, you don't really Um, because of that counterintuitiveness. And what you should know is that it's not about something like where you have an action and a reaction, a highly deterministic outcome, but you have something happen and probably something else could follow. Okay, so in order to study some of these effects, you also are talking about super, super, super cooling the particles, the subatomic particles, in order to be able to study how they interact with each other. Have I confused you all thoroughly yet? No? Damn it. All right. Give me some time. So when we talk about uh, quantum and we try to figure out how we do quantum information science, we look at writing information on quantum bits or qubits. And, you know, you guys all know binary, that's zero and one, right? Well, quantum bits or qubits are the zero and the one at the same time. They, they exist in this, like, superposition state continuously. Okay, so they're continuously this. And only when you actually do a measurement do they indicate whether they are a zero and a one. So there are zero and a one in all terms until you do a measurement and then they flip one way or the other. Clear? Okay. All right. Good. Um, Entanglement is this principle that actually gives a quantum computer, which has a lot of these qubits, scale. And the reason it does that is this is how we link the individual qubits, which are existing in this superposition state, to each other. So you'll have a zero and a one, and when you want to couple it with another zero and a one, so let's say I have a qubit that's positioned like this, in order for me to entangle, I basically flip the bits, right? And then I entangle these two to the other side. When the result is zero, of mixing this with this, then I know that they've been properly entangled. Okay? Clear? Still confused anyone yet? All right. Okay. So entanglement gives these quantum computers scale because of the following reason. Think about it this way. When I'm binary, I can be a zero or a one. So if you write something on this binary state, you write it in one of these two states, right? But when I write it in a qubit, you have to think that it's 2 to the n, all right? So if I am, uh, where n is the number of qubits. So if I have one qubit and it's 2 to the n, it's louder, guys. Come on. This I know we haven't had coffee, but come on. All right. 2 to the n, where n is 1, is good. 2 to the n when n is 3, when n is 4. When n is 5, 
here's the deal. This is an exponential thing. So because of this exponential capability, with only very few qubits, I have tons of space to write on. In the same spot where I had this one binary probability of like the zero or the one, if I have two to the x or n, where I have multiple qubits entangled to each other, I have this exponentially increasing space to write my information. This is the power of quantum computing. So the idea is you have these qubits, you entangle them together. When you've achieved that, you have this massive amount of space to write all of these possibilities. Are we clear? Do we understand how cool and kick-ass quantum computing is <laughs> just from this principle? All right. Okay. Problem with entanglement. Einstein didn't believe it. He called it spooky action at a distance. He said, this is bullshit. You know, God does not play dice. He won't give you this probabilistic outcome. You cannot tell me that you can combine things over an arbitrary distance, have them so coupled that a flip on the one entangled side, photon side, will result in a flip in the other side. No fucking way. Doesn't happen. And why doesn't it happen? Anyone know? Hell yes. Thank you. We talked about it last night. But it violates relativity because this is happening faster than the speed of light. Okay? What? No, there is. So that's... Right. This is the thing. All right? So here's the deal. There are scientists at the TU Delft who, when I uh, presented this paper, it was only a few months after they did this, there was an article published in Nature. You can still Google it now. There's a great YouTube video. Please go look. Okay? It's all about the loophole-free bell test. And what they did is this test across this university campus with two diamonds. And what they've done is they've taken the electrons in these diamonds, they've entangled them, then they had photons added to the mix, they entangled those, and then they did this swap test across the distance of this university campus. And what they saw is that faster than the speed of light on multiple tests, and also validated and verified by other scientists you had this loophole-free test which always resulted in this spooky action being verified and basically proving Einstein wrong. There is something that goes faster than the speed of light in this thing. We don't know how. We don't know how the hell they're managing to communicate across this arbitrary distance. We don't understand it. And we can't explain it. But we can observe it. We can see that it's happening and that it's been validated. This is crazy, scary, kick-ass shit. And the result of which means that because of the power that we give from a quantum computer, you know, we saw Moore's Law, right? Everybody remembers Moore's Law? Yes? But now what we're seeing is Amdahl's Law, which is you keep adding processing power, or you keep adding chips, but you don't have the necessary increase in processing power. So what you're seeing is a sort of uh, parabolic shift downwards. Instead of this continuously increasing exponential effect of Moore's, you're seeing Amdahl's kind of going, eh, not so much. And because of Amdahl's law and our decreasing processing power, we basically need alternatives to still get our high for our computing resources. So there is no alternative other than to look at quantum computers. By the way, I have to be very clear, quantum computers are not there for you to like do little cool funky things. They're really there for scientific um, analysis and very specific types of problem sets. So it's not going to make your home computer any faster. It, okay. Um, and what we see is that there's like, before we even thought about having a quantum computer, we already had two algorithms, Shor's and Grover's. Shor does integer factorization. Everybody remember our, their high school math? Remember what integer factorization is? Okay, good. Anyone not remember? Don't be shy. Okay, you raise your hand in the back. Good. Okay, all the people who are cool and say they did remember, uh, what, you know, claim to be cool, um, someone tell them what integer factorization is, please. Okay, that I'm going to help you. Um, so, like, uh, let's take a, a, a number, like, um, pick a number. Sure, 34. So, we know that, like, there are certain thingies that get to 34, right? So, what are all the integers that will get us 34? Huh? 
to right but what else one and 34 okay so here's the deal right that's how we get it but for cryptography this is relevant why very good so the idea is with crypto cryptography we're always using very large primes right with and what we're trying to figure out is when we have these very large primes we multiply them together and we get the ciphertext as a result as a product of these you know large primes we want no one to be able to factor back from just having a sample of the encrypted traffic we don't want them to get to our original keys that is why integer factorization would be kind of like a snag in that whole cryptography thing. So um, as a result of which, we don't want anyone to be able to do it. So the algorithm is there. It's just waiting for a quantum computer with enough entangled qubits in order to be able to run shore. And this is what the whole bloody planet is working on right now to try to figure that out. The second thing you have is Grover. Grover's algorithm is doing the optimization of large database searches. And so what Grover's gets to do is basically look at all of the possible answers, filter them all out simultaneously. It basically runs all the options at the same time. That doesn't blow your mind. I don't know what will. But Grover's gets to do that. So it just tries all the outcomes at once. And then as a result of which, figures out which one is correct to solve the problem. Yeah? I'm sorry? Yeah, the P and NP problem. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, the, the idea is because of Shores and Grover's attached to a quantum computer, instead of looking at all the opportunities, look, there are some really cool opportunities. We could do personalized medicine. We can cure cancer. We can do protein folding stuff. We can uh, figure out, I don't know, uh, new fuels and nanotechnology. We can do all kinds of scientific modeling on a quantum computer, which could potentially, you know, save the human race from the cesspit that we are currently in. But um, the downside is, it breaks crypto. Okay? Pretty bad. Um, and everybody all over the planet is in on this quantum race. Everybody wants to get there first because of the huge strategic advantage of reading everybody else's secrets. So one of the solutions, and the one that I initially got interested in, was quantum key distribution. So we all know Alice and Bob. They're our friends, right? So when Alice wants to talk to Bob, bless you, and uh, she uses a quantum channel, which is just a fiber optic cable, that's lights quantum. So there are so many quantum effects. You know, photosynthesis is a quantum effect. Everything is quantum all over us. But the clue is that Alice is going to talk to Bob over a fiber optic uh, channel. What she's worried about is the presence of Eve. What she wants to do is basically figure out if Eve is there. And this simple picture looks slightly more complicated, but not that much. Everybody knows what a polarizer is, right? Everybody has polarized sunglasses at least once? Okay. So this is basically like a more expensive polarized sunglasses. All right? What we do is we take the light, and when we orient it through our polarizers, we shift the uh, qubit in a particular orientation. Okay, the, the single photon that we've sent through that thing is polarized in a particular orientation. We set up Alice's polarizers in a particular config. We tell Bob via a secondary out-of-bound channel, and that can use classic cryptography, which is one of the reasons a lot of cryptographers hate this, by the way. But um, So we use classic cryptography to tell Bob how Alice has configured her polarizers. Bob then configures his polarizers in order to receive it. If Eve is trying to read Alice's bit sequence, she fucks it up because she's interrupting it and there's no way to measure without changing. It's one of the principles of quantum. Because of this, no cloning uh, effect either. She can't copy it and you can't change it and you can't monitor it. That uh, sequence gets shifted. So if Eve is on the line, even when they're using the right config on both sides, Bob will get complete crap. Okay? That's how they know this lining is no longer secure. We have to do something else. And, you know, there's some issues with this when you have to do this over fiber, because fiber has distance limitations. You can't go more than 64 kilometers. So how many of you communicate every once in a while with people who are further than 64 kilometers away from you? Kind of a small snag, right? So we can't use it effectively. But there's this possibility of free space quantum. So there was this experiment that was already done three years ago. Paolo Villarese, an Italian researcher dude from University of Padova, basically put a quantum link between Las Palmas and Tenerife in the Canary Islands in Europe. Basically, he had that um, big-ass laser 
shooting from one observation point to the other observation point, and he managed to get a pretty stable thing. Even with the water vapor and everything, it was pretty stable. So he managed to have a fully encrypted link over this laser. That was pretty damn cool. No more 64 kilometers, this is 144. You know, but I don't think it's a solution all the time, and we'll explain why in a minute. The other thing that you can do is say, okay, our algorithms, specifically like RSA, uh, all of the elliptic curve shit is screwed because of these factoring uh, possibilities from Shore and Grover. So what we should do is move over to a new set of algorithms where even when you have a quantum computer, they're still unbreakable. And we've had Mechalis already since 1978. So we've had a post-quantum algorithm that could totally still work today, except, you know, you have to optimize it, you know, and it's still NP-hard. The worry is that without it, you will always have a problem. Okay. And the NSA also did the Sweet B uh, from August 2015 uh, to recommend that everybody in the government already transition to that new set of algorithms. Schneier talked about it, and, you know, I had this. This was my closing slide in the flashback track. But here's the deal. Since I spoke to you guys last, every slide you just saw was the exact set of slides I used at the last time. But since that I spoke to you, Schrodinger's cat got a bit bigger. And the space that occupies the quantum space is everywhere. So there is no one I talk to that's not doing something now in quantum. And that's different. So uh, when you take a look at what's happening in the world, agencies haven't stopped hacking. You know, we like WannaCry is the latest in a series of shit from the hardware stuff and the super micro crap. I mean, we're all still doing the same shit different day, right? None of the modus operandi, well, they've, they've gotten a bit more, you know, thingied, ad advanced, more ingrained. But like I was showing Dylan outside today, like we just saw a thunderclap. So it's continuously going to go on. We're not stopping it now. What we do these days, though, is we out the bad guys. So we take photos of the spies. We put it on Twitter and you know news media. And we say, these are Russian GRU agents that were in Amsterdam to go and try to tap into the OPCW. We didn't do that before. So that's new. Um, and what you also uh, should know, which is new, is that uh, China in the last couple of years, also launched the world's first quantum communication satellite. And, unlike every other country on the planet, they built a 2,000-kilometer-long, fully quantum, trusted node network across the length of China, from Beijing to Shanghai. Fucking hell. That is so serious, and there's no other country that's able to do this type of effort, just purely from an engineering standpoint, let alone from a financial and everything else. So they are way ahead of everybody else just because that their communications from a national perspective cannot be tapped at all. So although, you know, they're perfectly, instead of potentially doing things to other people, their own OPSEC is pretty darn good. When you want to examine for yourselves, though, the power potential of a quantum computer, you have to first think, like, how long do you need to keep your cryptography or your data or whatever? How long do you need to keep this stuff secure? Any ideas? How long do you need to keep your data secure? Any ideas here? For your telecom, it's 18 months. 18 months. Well, that's going to be. And uh, But, like, what about your medical health data? What about everybody who's doing Ancestry.com data? or your DNA data that you're sending off to 23andMe, or your health and medical records that you leave at local hospitals, or how long does that need to be secure? Yeah, so we don't know how to do that. We do not know how to secure your data for a lifetime. Let's just start from there, okay? Um, how long before there's a viable quantum computer that breaks into our secrets? Any ideas? How, who, how many? 12 to 20. Where'd you get that number? Okay, so I think that's that's like a, that you're in the mid range, but I, I would say I just did a RAND study on this. So the most optimistic estimates is five years, and that the research that's actually like saying that it's five years is not in the public domain. So these are state sponsored attackers working on this like they would have worked on the Manhattan Project. They've taken a bunch of scientists and their families, they have moved them to a reservation where they are working in complete and utter secrecy as a national strategic objective. So that's the five years. Excuse me? Well, 
it, well, this is not so scary, but it, it's probably a realistic possibility in some countries who have the investment opportunity and the availability to attract these type of scientists. The issue is attracting these scientists because the majority of scientists want to work in the public domain. The ones that are really good with this stuff do. So um, here's the deal. So five is hyper optimistic, I think. Um, and then you have this extrapolation of, you know, never. We'll have cold fusion before we ever have a, a proper viable quantum computer that's actually capable of breaking our crypto. Um, and then the last question is, how long do we need to transition our network and systems to one that's quantum safe? Like, how long would India need to go all quantum safe with all her algorithms? Okay, so let me just ask, how's that IPv6 thing coming along? <laughs> we suck at speed. Our whole problem has always been one of speed. We need to get better, faster, in order to be smarter with this stuff. So uh, when it look when you look at, you know, like what is the re real threat when it comes to algorithmic stuff and we're looking at breaking stuff where we used to say, okay, look, it takes a lifetime of the universe to break some of the algorithms we have. We're talking about a matter of seconds. So we need that phase plan of defense. First and foremost, everybody, wherever you use crypto across your network for whatever purpose you use it, you have a key length. Okay, you probably have optimized that key length to not use the maximum key size. Size matters here, gentlemen. Size definitely matters. So make sure, I'm just kidding, come on. So make sure you use the optimum key length, like the maximum key length that's affordable to you under all of the algorithms you have running in your network. The second thing is look for options to use quantum key distribution because there are some, like, you know, probably a primary and secondary data center where it's a viable alternative. It is not viable across your network, but there might be very specific points where you would have a case to worry. It's there, okay? And what I believe in is using these things in... Uh, union, you know, they use multiple things at the same time. So you don't just say, okay, I only do this, but you do a staggered effort based on what's available. And this is off the shelf technology. So you can easily set up a QKD link with no problem. It'll take you a week to set up. And finally, look at post quantum algorithms, you know, that are going to come out of NIST, but don't wait for NIST to come out. Just try your own. Again, there's a huge issue of capture now and decrypt later. It's a real picture of the NSA data center facility in Utah where they make huge copies of all kinds of traffic that's running across the internet. And this is not fiction. So they actually make copies. A lot of governments capture traffic and keep it for quite some time. And the fundamental thing is old secrets are sometimes just as interesting as new ones because there's a certain amount of predictive force where if you have the old secret at your disposal, you can kind of extrapolate other characteristics that would allow you to hack things later. Okay? What we did is we started with a toe dip in the water by creating our own uh, quantum link between um, The Hague and Rotterdam, between two data centers. And there was a distance that we did. Now we're building a fully quantum internet backbone across four nodes in the country. We're working with universities to do it. It'll be completed by 2021. I think this is really fucking cool because we actually have quantum computers on other sides of these links. So it's truly fully quantum. It's not the trusted node uh, setup that we have everywhere else because the trusted node is just, you know, it's Alice to Bob, Bob to Charlie, and Charlie to Thingy. So when you need to have a full chain of trust, when Alice wants to communicate with Zed, uh, it's going to be really, really difficult uh, unless she has to, you know, flip every time between all of these intermediary hops. This will be fully end-to-end -end because it's going to use entanglement as a property to get a quantum repeater, which doesn't exist yet. So that means we can bridge those distance limitations we have on fiber, and we have the potential to build a brand new form of internet, a blueprint for a quantum internet where the basis of your telecommunications infrastructure will be fully encrypted by default. The feds are scared shitless. This is what it really looks like. So this is not common off-the-shelf technology yet. So where you have a quantum key distribution trusted node network, you can just buy it and plug in your rack. This is not rackable. Um, and what you see is QKD is being used now to support military op operations and for critical infrastructure continuity purposes. And this is a concern because I don't think this is the only realm of operations. What I do think would be really interesting is this is a picture of um, the Starlink setup from Elon Musk. Uh, 
I think that there might be actual opportunities to think about using QKD from space in between these satellites. Why do you think QKD from space to Earth sucks? Any idea? What? That's a beautiful answer, but the real answer is you can't use a quantum link from space to Earth when there's sunlight or when it rains. And sometimes there's sunlight, like, you know, half of the day. And the other time, you know, every once in a while, there's rain. So atmospheric disturbances allow any quantum link that goes from space to a ground station to be problematic. But in between the vacuum of space, to use a fully encrypted link is an awesome bloody possibility. Think about it. Fully meshed, awesome quantum network there. So um, if anybody knows Elam, hit me up. I want to, like, pray at the altar of Mr. Musk um, and, like, let him know about this idea to do this, all right? So, okay. Anyway, uh, post-quantum standards, uh, they're only going to be available by 2024. Don't wait for them. Start playing now. So what we do is we have our own little uh, team at CISO Lab. So you might, you might know Phil Zimmerman. He wrote PGP. Phil is in my team. So I'm very lucky. Um, but, you know, he's in my team. He listens to no one. It's a mess. Anyway. Um, so Phil is leading our post-quantum efforts. So what we've done is uh, we have a PhD in post-quantum and in quantum communications. We have dedicated resources. We work with universities, and we basically build a fully post-quantum implementation of a VPN. And we want to make it part of the standard Linux distribution so it's open source and available to everybody else. Uh, we also are working on a post-quantum version of SSH, and pretty soon we'll have a post-quantum version of PGP. Woo! So... Yeah, and we have a timeline for that, and uh, we're, we're starting it. Like, we've already finished with the VPN. It's uh, finishing, um, and we're using Kyber, which is still in the running as a NIST standard. That's what we're hoping it gets. You know, we think it has a high possibility, but we have a high degree of crypto agility, so if it doesn't become the standard, we can swap it out and put another one in. Um, and then post-quantum SSH stuff, we spoke to the guy, you know, uh, what's his name, um, the dude who started SSH, and he wants to work with us. That's good. And we are planning uh, the whole stuff around PGP. Um, so for all of you, Inventorize those crypto assets. Think it through in terms of when you're going to be ready. Look for that crypto agility in your own solutions. Engage your hardware and software people to get their shit in order. Make sure you have all of this stuff built in as a requirement in your supplier security annexes when you do selection and, you know, all that other stuff. And make sure you start failing. Find out what doesn't work now. Don't wait for the standard. Find out what doesn't work now so that when the standard arrives, you'll be totally ready to go and put it in place. Good? Here's the deal. My job is CISO of KPN. I have to make sure that we are trusted by our customers, partners, and society. Um, and that means I need to keep myself and our team valid and worthy of that trust. We can only do it when we can guarantee that long-term secrecy. So please, like, make sure you can do the same for your customers and partners and company. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I think I'm out of time, but questions? Okay, questions? Wow, really? Oh, go ahead. Yes. What would happen if suddenly uh, tomorrow morning there's news that a quantum links and all that exist and the country has the ability to decrypt everyone else's Yeah, then we're all screwed. Yeah. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, here's the deal, right? Um, did you ever see, like, what was the mo movie with Alan Turing? I forgot the name of it. Um, a Beautiful Mind or? Imitation game, yeah. So do you, so Alan Turing, imitation game, so he had the ability um, to crack Enigma, right? So here's the deal. Do you think that the English ran out and told everyone, look, I can break your stuff? No. And you know, I've been to our intelligence services in the Netherlands, and in the, they have a little museum in the front. What's really funny is the following. They used the Enigma machines to actually encrypt traffic, you know, far beyond, I won't tell you the date because I don't want to embarrass anyone, but far beyond uh, World War II because the British didn't let them know that they can read their stuff. They were like, yeah. In fact, the British recovered Enigma devices, gave it to the allies, their allies, and said, 
Use this. It's really good crypto. We got it from the Germans. Super good stuff. Okay? So they gave it to their allies knowing full and well that they could read their traffic. And I think that this is the same thing. You're going to keep your strategic advantage here to read everyone else's secrets as long as possible. So as long as you can keep it out of the public realm, the better. Yeah. I guess that's a negative effect of the question or comment on this early. Yeah. Five, it's five to never. Well, but is it? The most optimistic is five. Or was it five before we figured out? Oh, you mean? You truly believe that it still factors out. Well, so, so, I, so look, do, I, okay, so I, I gotta tell you maybe where I get my information from. So I'm on the EU, uh, committee to do all things quantum, so the EU, EU flagship, and I'm also on the Etsy, uh, post quantum, uh, team. So being in Etsy and the EU, I have access to some of the best people in the field, and this is what they tell me. So it's also a little bit of polling between friends about what do you think? What do you think? And, yeah. you know, it's like the Microsoft guys are doing so much work. Google it has multiple bets on a, on a quantum computer. So it really depends. And like, I mean, there's some amazing people working on this stuff yeah, from... Would, would yeah. Still let me think that there's much further yeah. Progress yeah. Well, the NSA announcing Sweet B. Like that, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's like it's all going back to Manhattan Project. And yeah. 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 Well, so in the Snowden documents, one of the Snowden documents was actually referred to um, a quantum computer, but at the time they were looking at trying to develop something of like eight or nine qubits. That is nothing, you know? Um, so that is like, okay, but it's not monumental. So trying to get that far, and that was 2009. Maybe they're a bit further, but they're still nowhere near the range that I've seen in some universities. And the biggest problem, look, to build a quantum computer... Um, it's not just having good engineering. It's also like there's a certain amount of finickiness and, and uh, demonstrable amount of uh, static in the noise and where it is. So you have these super, super cooled uh, environments. You know, it's like they're, the scientists that are there that are working on the quantum computers, we're talking about freezing things colder than outer space in order to study them in the lab. And when you build qubits, there's all different types of topology. You know, there's uh, quantum dots. There's like this mesh ruby thing. There's, you can do this on diamonds. So there's all different pl- because they're looking for like this perfect structure, this crystalline structure in order to put the photons in and, and set it all up. And there's braiding. So there's uh, they're just studying the different topology parts of how you build a quantum computer is a study in and of itself. Just on that, you could easily talk for two hours. So because of this nature of complexity, it's hard to say like, okay, this one person has all of those um, solutions. So it's engineering, it's topology, it's actually being able to not get those qubits in a state where they decohere and evaporate. What's one of the problems with quantum computers is now when you're building physical qubits, right? That doesn't scale well. So the the thing is to try to build a universal quantum computer with logical qubits that does scale, you know, exponentially. And that's really hard to do. So IBM, Google, Microsoft, they're running their asses off. And then the amount of money that's being poured by China, it's not just a public effort. It's also um, Alibaba, Jack Ma, had pledged like $16 billion to quantum research, you know, to develop labs all over the world. I mean, that's a shitload of money. The whole EU flagship is one billion. When I got onto this EU team, I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. There's only three flagships in the EU, the graphene project, the human brain project, and the third one is quantum. So I thought, this is so cool. I get to be on it. Yay. But then I realized it's not so cool. It's one billion spread out over 10 years where only 500 million comes from the EU and the other 500 million has to come from country contributions. So the EU together puts 500 million on the table and China is putting billions and in one year. So it's not a fair game. It's a completely asymmetric space. So your guess is as good as mine when we get there. Yeah. 
from computing uh, satellite communication in the giant called by China. And the other remark I'm just going back where it has a limitation because of the weather. Um, how how the how the maximum can utilize or what what would be the application or use if 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 that technology had kind of a limitation? How we which technology? So, so you know how they they launch the satellite, but yes. you were mentioning that due to the way that it could either work. Yes, so yeah. satellite to Earth, yeah, but they also have satellite to satellite. So the Chinese also did a fully um, encrypted satellite to satellite connection. Um, uh, also with the University of Padua, they did satellite to ground. So they've also done a transatlantic connection for, uh, like they did a video conference. You know, so this satellite is going to be used way more for all of these things, and it's only getting more popular rather than less, despite some of the implementation obstacles. Well, I don't think, look, I'm not saying throw the baby out of the bathwater. I'm saying do what we always did. We always, we, we know defense in depth as cybersecurity. That's all I'm suggesting. Get your stuff prepared. Think it through. Make sure you have multiple alternatives. Don't put all of your eggs in any one basket. We absolutely should not, you know, throw away everything we do now. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying make sure you supplement it with post-quantum algorithms, look at UKD, and figure out what your current cryptography is and how it's doing. Right? Okay. Hey, one last thing. Does anybody work, I'm going to say the magic words, on like artificial intelligence at the moment? So, of course, like the ultimate like vanilla ice cream sundae combination is uh, hardware topology using a quantum computer and trying to figure out how to map the uh, exponential hardware uh, with some really smart software um, and machine learning to, to actually think about, you know, combining the two flavors um, into something that's actually worthwhile. Because instead of just looking at artificial intelligence work in software, look at, you know, how do you actually map that onto a topology that's quantum? Because it, the software part of it is just as much of a challenge as the hardware. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.